<clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Joel. It's real my pleasure to be participant in this uh, very important uh, discussion. And uh, I have a few slides to introduce the subject, so I will share it. And the basic uh, thing which I think it is already stressed by Joel and Helen about the importance of the data and also the services which we need to provide. And uh, I think the we need to connect both the scientific information which we have how we can convert this information into a knowledge or information which can be used by the stakeholders, in this case, a fisherman. And uh, the most important thing is the, as far as uh, the blue economy is concerned, I think fishery is one of the most important uh, component of the uh, blue economy. And it's not only about the fish, but I think we need to look at the entire uh, the system, including the coastal. So I will just like to give you the few idea about this. Uh, so basically, I would like to define the blue economy as ocean dependent economic development, which is essentially targeted to improve the quality of life of people. But at the same time, it should be inclusive social development and while maintaining the environment and ecological security. So it's not only the economic development, but we have to ensure both the environment and ecology are preserved for its sustainable use. And that is one reason the, the SDG goal 15, that how we can use sustainably use the ocean seas and marine resources. I think that should be our main area through which we should work. Now in India, we have been uh, working on this area for quite some time, for the last almost 25 years. And I will just give you the glimpse of the area which we have been working. We also need to see the diversity, but in diversity part, the health of the coastal environment. And the most important, the ocean, I mean, the entire database which we have has to be a digital so that we can get the information about any point any time uh, and anywhere. Uh, this is the service which is we are providing to Indian uh, fishermen for last uh, 25 years, uh, where we provide the information that where the potential areas of a fishery. And the potential yield in Indian waters is about 5.31 million tons. And we are harvesting about 3.8 million tons. So most of the area which is be harvested is within the biological sustainable limits. So this is the one very important aspect because the one, the service which is essentially based on a chlorophyll which indicates the availability of a food and the environmental condition which is uh, we get by the sea surface temperature and sea surface wind and sea surface height. This, all these three are combined together into a model, and this information is provided to all the fishermen. Now, the, the main benefit which is coming is the environmental benefit because they don't have to search for the school of fish. So the reduction in a search time is about 60-70%. That means that much less carbon dioxide is put into the atmosphere. And the catch is increased about two to four times, and the success rate is about 80%. And this has substantially improved the economic condition of a fisherman, because for each trip, the minimum advantage which they make is about 250 US dollars. So this is a quite a bit of money each trip, the additional money by using uh, the advisory. So basically, we are reducing their effort to catch the fish. So that is where the economic advantage is coming. Along with this, we also provide the other ocean state information, which is uh, about the currents, waves, the mixed layer there, the sea surface temperature, the tides, and all this information together, uh, they could make very informed decision that where should go and what kind of uh, conditions would be there in that particular region. Of course, this forecast is also used by 
many other stakeholders, the shipping industry, ports, harbors, and many others. Now, this is the one part, but the also important is that we should also able to estimate what is the yearly or annually the pelagic fishery stock available. So here also the monthly climatology of sea surface temperature chlorophyll is being used to find out that what is likely primary productivity would be. And once we know the primary productivity, seasonal primary productivity, we can very well estimate that what would be the secondary and tertiary productivity, which gives us an idea that how much uh, potential yield would be available in a given region. Now, the, the third important aspect is the climate. In the many uh, areas, especially on the southwest coast of India, the two major fisheries, the oil sardine and mackerel, Indian mackerel, uh, has the catch has been reduced after 1985. And many times it has been said that it is mainly because of overfishing. But what we found is it's not necessarily only because of the overfishing, but because of the warming of the sea, the fishery has started shifting towards northwards. Uh, which was essentially between 8 and 14 degree north, has now mostly shifted to 14 and 20 degree north, and also on the east coast. So I think the warming of the sea is also definitely making a major change. And I think we need to collect the data about this, that how the things have changed over the last 50 years or so. We also need to look at the dip. Uh, sea resources. Mostly in India, uh, the fishery is mostly coastal fishery. And uh, now we know that there is a huge resource available about between 200 to 2000 meter depth. There are new grounds of a fin, shellfish, as well as the, some of the chimera and shark have been discovered. So this, of course, this will need uh, uh, different kinds of uh, technology for the catching this fish as well as uh, processing. But this is the uh, one which is a very promising area. Also, there is another fish, which is a non table fish, Mictophyte, which we have estimated about 100 million tons, which is likely to be available. And this could be extremely good for the brackish water fish as a feed. Also, there are now, because of the warming, the incidence of harmful algal bloom also is increasing. So we also provide a service where these blooms are occurring, how it is growing, and how it is uh, decaying. So this information is also routinely provided so that fishermen knows that where the blooms are, and if there are toxic blooms, it is advisable not to go do the fishing there. So we don't provide the advisory in those areas where the toxic algal blooms are there. So this also helps to uh, not only to save the efforts, but also the security of the human being who are likely to consume this fish. There are a lot of new uh, technology. One is on the environmental ornamental fishery. Now this is uh, being done in uh, one of the island in Lakshmi. And this has been now being managed by the Women's Cooperative in the island. And this is a very successful experiment. And this is now being repeated in many other islands. Also, the cage, uh, we have now developed a technology for rearing the fish into the sea cages, uh, cobia and milkfish. And this, in about 10 to 11 months, it can grow and we can have the catch, which is also. And this is the uh, new thing which is now being done and the technology is now being perfected for the transfer to the fisherman. Also, there are many bioactive molecules and the new drugs which can be developed from this flora and fauna. There are a couple of drugs have been developed using the bioactive molecules, but there is a, it's itself is a big topic, but I just want to flag that this is also a very important area for the research. And the other important thing that we also need to look at the marine 
biodiversity, the census of uh, marine uh, fauna and flora is being done. And this is uh, done three degree by three degree. And it is also part of uh, Ocean Biogeographic Information System. And uh, the Indian part is, uh, Indian Ocean part is being looked after by the Institute in India, CMLRE. And the large amount of data, about more than 350,000 data is available on the different aspects, uh, right from the sea surface to the bottom of the sea. And this is, I think, is uh, very important. And this cannot be done by a single country. It has to be done in the collaboration with all others. At the same time, we also need to look at the coastal ecosystem and the environment. We have the complete inventory of the coastal habitats, mangroves, seagrass, coral reefs, and their health is being monitored routinely. So we know that which area is under any stress. Also at the same time, we also find out erosional and depositional areas annually. And this is also important because many times because of engineering activity, as well as the rise of the sea, the many areas under erosion deposition also occurs. And the impact of the sea level change, which is about three millimeters on the average, but on the Indian coast is quite varying, right from a couple of millimeter to 11 millimeter in uh, the Sundarbans. So there is a large variation in the sea level which is changing. And this is also very important because the rise of the sea level, it will affect the coastal fauna, uh, flora, especially the mangroves. And the, from the marine loving mangroves, it will change to a uh, fresh loving uh, flora will change to the marine loving. So this will also has its own issue uh, about the changing the biodiversity of the area. Also the monitoring of the water quality is being done right from 1990 onwards at the certain transacts uh, routinely. So we know that where the water quality is, uh, if there is any adverse impact on the fauna. Now there is a large amount of data actually. Uh, I understand Dr. Pattavi would be there in the next uh, uh, panel discussion. And the ISO INCOIS has a large amount of data on uh, Indian Ocean, which is collected from variety of in-situ platforms the satellite data, also some of the model outputs and some of the thematic maps. Large amount of information is available and every year it has been increasing. Uh, and this is all available to any uh, researcher who would like to use this information. And this is now being converted into what we call as a digital ocean because you, we have the very heterogeneous data like uh, uh, sea surface temperature could be from the satellite, from the in situ data, from the Argo floats. But if you want the one information up across a transact for a given area, or you want to visualize in 3D, 4D, all this is being possible using the entire data. So this is what uh, I have to say uh, very quickly uh, about the what uh, we have been doing. Now, what we need to do is, what we believe is beyond 2030, the growth, we will have to invest very heavily in the coastal and the ocean environments. Now, the environmental data is also going to be very critical. And we need to organize this information in such a way that we can integrate them along with the social and economic data so that we have an accounting system and we can say that how this each of the activity is benefiting the economy as well as the security of the ecology as well as the environment. And I think the most important, what we lack is the institutional framework which Joel also mentioned in his initial talk that we need a system by which we can manage and govern this whole uh, ocean wealth. And I think uh, we will have to see that these oceans are managed in such a way that it is sustainable for the future. Thank you very much.